Hello. Uh, for those of you who haven't been lucky enough to watch one of my recordings so far, my name is Simon Holhan, and uh, this recording is going to be looking at swaps, and in particular, the uh, pricing and valuing of different types of swaps. So you'll see from the uh, loan outcome statements that the first laws go straight into the detail. There's no, there's no, there's no nice easy losses here of just describe a swap, or it goes straight for the jugular pricing and valuing. So this is a, a technical uh, area. The good news for us is they are still focusing on the sort of traditional, often what's called a single curve way of pricing swaps. The market has actually moved on. We, we tend to have a different approach to pricing swaps these days. Uh, some of you may well be aware of, of using uh, overnight interest rate swaps, OAS, to discount the cash flows of a swap. Now we're not doing that for CFA. So for CFA we're doing a single curve. What that means is the, the cash flows of a swap will be based on LIBOR and we'll use LIBOR to also present value the cash flow. So we're using a, a consistent interest rate in all parts of our calculation. That makes it an awful lot more straightforward. But let's really look at the foundation. But once you've mastered this, if you want to understand how to do dual curve or OAS discounting, it's much easier to make that jump once you have this basics. So, so don't write off the CFA uh, swap curriculum. It's a really good foundation that will help you understand uh, where the market is at the moment. But we're going to focus on the CFA version, so pricing and valuing uh, swaps. We're also going to discuss how a swap is an equivalent to other derivatives. This is quite a strong theme running through the curriculum, making sure you know that if a, a client had a certain view or certain need, perhaps they're worried about interest rates going up, you need to be aware of the variety of solutions that we could offer that client. Right? And we'll have a chat about that in due course. Uh, then we'll move on to other types of swaps. We'll look at uh, equity swaps, lots of variations there. Uh, and finally, currency swaps, probably the hardest of the three. All right, so there's, there's a lot of detail to get our teeth uh, stuck into. But let's first of all think about an interest rate swap. Okay. Now again, the curriculum here it has ignored the last few years of market development. These days, uh, virtually all swaps, certainly major swaps, are centrally cleared. Uh, but this is irrelevant for us in the CFA, where we are looking at almost before this happened. So we are still assuming that a swap is a, a bilateral contract, uh, it's two parties, uh, there is no clearing house in between. The, so we're assuming these are OTC, uh, very uh, loosely stroke not regulated, uh, where each contract is tailor-made, uh, so you can have any size swap for any length of time. Uh, and because they are over-the-counter bilateral contracts, uh, you will have counterparty risk. Uh, so these are our assumptions we're looking at here. The most important thing for you to highlight, though, is the day count convention. So when we're using uh, LIBOR rates, now we know that LIBOR is always quoted on an annual basis, on a simple annual basis, and we're going to have to deannualize those rates because you know, the chances are the swap we're looking at will have uh, cash flow periods of less than one year. So if we were doing a semi-annually settled swap, we'll have to take an annual rate and make it into a six-month periodic rate. So if we were given, for example, six-month LIBOR, let's say six-month LIBOR was, I know, 2%, we have to deannualize that. So in our calculation, we're going to be doing the 1 plus RT approach. So remember, when using simple quoted interest rates, you're not using compound numbers. Had it been quoted on an effective annual basis, then of course it would be 1 plus R to the power T. So it's very important to know the assumption of each reading. So a lot of the derivatives readings, the assumption is when you're given a rate, it's an effective annual rate, it's a compound rate. So if you think back to other readings, a lot of it has been 1 plus R to the power T, or it could have been continuously compounded, your e to the power of RT. But here in the land of swaps, uh, also with forward rate agreements, I should add, um, we are doing 1 plus RT. So the R is a simple quoted money market, if we want to use that term, uh, rate of interest. Now, of course, in the money markets, in the real world, there's lots of different conventions of deannualizing a rate. In our little CFA land, there's only one convention, which I must say is the is the main one, certainly in the American money markets and Euro. So it's not that, that unrealistic. So we're using a T to be a fraction of a year, but where a year is based on 360. So this part here, the T part, we based on the number of days over 
360. Now I must say most of the examples in the CFA reading don't even give you the days. Yeah, they just talk about three months, four months, six months. So the chance is going to be like six over 12. If you were given the number of days, then fine, use it. So in this calculation here, we'd have one plus, we'd take the 2%, and then we'd times it by some amount of days. Let's, for argument's sake, say that in this six month period, there are 180 days. Yeah. You'll be given that, you won't be able to count this up. So we'd times it by 180 over 360. And that will give us our one plus RT. Now, of course, if we're present valuing a cash flow, we have to then divide it by this one plus RT. This is exactly the same as taking the cash flow and timesing it by one over one plus RT. Now, of course, the second approach, as you are undoubtedly aware of, when we do one over that, we refer to that as a discount factor. And so in reality, it's the discount factors is what we're going to be using in this reading. Uh, it's quite common that you'll be given the discount factors. All right? But I will go through an example or two to make sure you can calculate it just in case you're not. Uh, there's, no, there's no guarantee you'll be given them. But if you are given a discount factor and you're given an expected cash flow in the future, it's very easy to work out the present value of that cash flow. But do note, it's a 360. If you find your, your finger moving towards the power button on your calculator, then take it off. Do not use powers here. And this is also the case for uh, swaps beyond a year. Not that there are any examples in the curriculum of a more than one year period. Yeah, but if I were, for example, had a swap where the cash flow was going to be, I don't know, in 14 months' time, then it would still be 1 plus RT, where T would be the ratio of 14 over 12, if you want to keep it simple. But don't really worry too much about what happens beyond that. You're not going to be doing pricing a five-year swap. All right? So we're going to keep it to a short period of swap. Uh, the longest example in the curriculum is a one-year swap. Okay, so that's why it makes sense to use uh, money market rates. So make sure you know the basics. Um, in the curriculum, there are some optional pages, uh, clearly labelled optional, at the beginning of this reading. So if you are a little bit rusty about swaps and about how the basically the cash flows, the mechanics of it work, then uh, have a quick look through the optional reading. But you probably should be familiar with swaps. We have seen them a little bit at level one. So remember the, the key basics here. The cash flows are netted off. So although we think about a swap as, for example, paying fixed and receiving LIBOR, you don't actually pay the fixed amount and then wait to receive the floating amount. We work out the difference between the two and net them off. And in doing so, we reduce the uh, credit risk. Right? So make sure you're okay with the basics of a simple swap. Right? I'm going to do a little diagram just to uh, remind you if you are forgotten. Um, if you know the basics, then obviously feel free to fast forward here. So let's do a simple uh, interest rate swap. Let's imagine the uh, swap rates are, I don't know, 2 to 2.1%. For a certain maturity, certain um, what we call tenure, sometimes we refer to the tenure of a swap. That's the length of the swap, maturity of the swap. So I don't know, let's go for five year, doesn't really matter, you know, any year. So there's going to be two parties to a swap. So we'll have the uh, swap desk, the bank in the middle, who tends not to take on the risk. They simply uh, take two, have two clients either side and they make the spread. Then we have one client, you know, client A, and one client, client B. Now, one of these clients is worried about rates going up. So let's have, these are worried that interest rates are going to go up. Well, and there could be a speculator. Perhaps they are speculating that they are going to go up. Either way, they want a derivative that will make them money if that happens. And let's have number B, uh, client B. Let's do the opposite. They are worried that rates may go down. So who could these be? Well, um, A could be uh, a corporate who funds themselves at, at a variable rate. Perhaps they use a, a, like a revolving credit facility on a, on a variable rate. And of course, if LIBOR goes up, they have to pay more for their, their credit. So having a swap that will make them money if rates go up will hedge that. Or A could be a, a fixed income investor, obviously, who are lo whose long bonds 
But if rates go up, bonds go down. So there's lots of people who could be A. B, who's going to be B? I'm worried about rates going down. Um, I guess the obvious one is an investor who's long cash, who has deposits on account, and of course is worried about the interest rate on those deposits falling. For the time being, though, we'll call them A and B. <coughs> so A is worried about rates going up. So you have two choices here with uh, interest rate swaps. You can pay fixed or receive fixed. Uh, do note in CFA land, we only ever describe a swap based on what's happening to the fixed leg. So you'll never hear or never see a reference to a receive floating or receive LIBOR swap. Uh, that will not be in the CFA uh, vocabulary. So if you're paying fixed, okay, by definition, you are receiving LIBOR. And if you are receiving fixed, you must be paying LIBOR or paying floating. Right, but we're going to focus on the fixed leg. Now, clearly, if you're worried about rates going up, then the way to make money from that is to receive more cash if rates go up. So actually, for A, they want to receive LIBOR. If LIBOR goes up to a million percent, that's okay. You are receiving a million percent on your principal. So A wants to receive LIBOR. So this variable cash flow, they want to receive. Now remember I said a moment ago, there's no such thing in our little world of a receive LIBOR swap. So think of it from the point of view of the fixed leg. So they want to uh, pay fixed. Actually, I apologize, I just wanna um, move my uh, diagrams around a moment. Uh, you'll see why in a moment. Now the reason I had to swap it around should be obvious because if you're receiving LIBOR, you must be paying fixed. Now whenever a client pays, and you're given a bid offer, I'm afraid, unfortunately, you never pay the lower one. So had I kept it that way, the other way around, it would look like we were paying 2%, which is clearly not the case. So if you are paying as a client, you'll pay the offer. Just like if you're buying a share, you pay money, you buy a share by paying at the offer price. If you sell a share, then you receive money and you'll receive the lower amount, you receive the bid. So do, I do apologize for that, just move it around to make it clear. So client A is worried about rates going up, they want to receive LIBOR. So in return, they have to pay fixed. There we are. So they're gonna pay fixed. And remember the amount they pay is the higher of the spreads, so they'll pay fixed at 2.1%. Now remember, the two cash flows are netted off. So it's not, so whenever we get to a payment date, it could be every three months, six months, who knows. But when we get to a payment date, we'll say, okay, what is the prevailing LIBOR? If LIBOR at that point turns out to be, I don't know, 2%, then you are paying 2.1, the difference is 0.1. Now do bear in mind though, all these rates are annual rates. And if this was a six month co contract, you'd have to, have to deannualize them, like we mentioned earlier. So there's a party A. Party B, of course, is worried about rates going down. So the last thing they want to do is to receive LIBOR. If, if rates go down to zero, they receive nothing. They, so they want to do the opposite, clearly. They want to pay LIBOR and receive a fixed amount. So if they pay LIBOR and LIBOR goes down to zero, great, they pay nothing and they receive a fixed cash flow. So party B wants to pay LIBOR to the bank and in return, they want to receive a fixed cash flow. That's just like if you're selling a share, you receive an amount of cash. So like a bid offer spread, no different there. So you receive fixed and you receive here at 2%. So the bank in the middle uh, is not, in my example, taking on any market risk. Yeah, the LIBOR gets passed through the swap desk and all the desk does is takes the spread between the fixed rates. And remember, both sides are netted off. So it's worth just familiarize yourself with the basic features of a swap. And I said before, this is discussed in the first few pages of the curriculum, but it is labeled optional reading. They also go through the basics of an equity swap, the basics of a currency swap as well. But let's now move on and look at pricing. Okay, pricing and valuing of a swap. Pricing just refers to the process of setting the initial terms of the swap. In other words, you are setting the fixed rate. So if you want to, for example, receive fixed, and I say, okay, receive fixed at 2%. Pricing is saying, well, where did I get that 2%? Why is it 2%? Why is it not three? Why is it not one? 
So pricing is setting the fixed rate at the outset of the swap. And we'll see, as you can probably imagine with any derivative, no one's going to give you a free lunch. Yeah, if I really felt interest rates for the next five years were going to be zero, I'm not going to let you receive 2% fixed and pay me the equivalent of zero. So the 2% which I quote must be what I and what the market thinks the average interest rates will be over the next over the tenure of the swap. And so when we present value the fixed cash flows you're receiving and present value the expected floating cash flows that you're paying, they're going to end up being zero. And this is the fundamental part of derivative valuation, which you would have seen in other readings. So the assumption is that we're doing what's called an on-market derivative. In other words, there's no free lunch at the beginning. So we are assuming that the market value of the swap is going to be zero. All right? And we'll deal with that in a moment. So pricing is setting initial terms. Valuing is obviously looking at the market value at any point. And we just said that the market value at time zero will be zero. Right. But of course, then things change. So you know, right now, we expect 2% to be the average of five years. Suddenly, the ECB surprises people, cuts rates further. Suddenly, the forward curve has now gone down. And you're thinking, fantastic, I'm receiving two, but there's no way the rates will go higher uh, than two on average over five years suddenly you, if you're the receiver, will accrue value. The other side, of course, will lose because they've locked in to pay 2.1 and receive uh, uh, floating. And if rates have unexpectedly come down, chances are you're going to receive less. So value will accrue beyond time zero based on a change in interest rates. Now, before we look at the, the maths, let's think about the equivalence of swaps with other derivative products. Now, let's just do a, a high-level look at this first of all. So let's imagine that we have a view, or we are worried, it doesn't matter, that interest rates are going to go up. So we've already said that if rates are going to go up and you want to make money from that, then really what you want to do is receive a floating leg, receive LIBOR. So if rates go up to a million percent, you receive a million percent. So you want to receive LIBOR. Now remember there's no such thing as that as far as we are concerned. But if you are receiving LIBOR, you must be paying fixed. So we can do a pay fixed swap. Okay. What if you want a bit more flexibility? What if you uh, think interest rates are going to go up, but not straight away? So what if you think, uh, you know what, they're going to go up in a year's time. So I don't want to lock in, I don't want to pay fixed now, but I'd like to pay fixed in a year's time. Now, okay, you could have a forward starting swap but we don't discuss that in the curriculum. The nearest thing we get to that is an option on a swap. So you could take an option to pay fixed. We call that a payer swaption. But that'd be an option to pay fixed. So you could take an option that has a one year expiry and in one year's time you can decide whether you want to pay fixed or not. What else have we, uh, could we look at? Well, maybe a forward rate agreement. Remember, this is a forward on an interest rate. So if the underlying, the interest rate, goes up and you want to make money if that is the case, then clearly you want to go long that forward. Just like anything, if you think oil is going to go up, you go long oil. So you go long a fra. Um, what else could you do? You could use uh, interest rate options. All right. So possibly you could have a, a call option. So an option on an interest rate. So you could buy a call option, a long call. Now this is strictly, although it's similar, it's not broadly equivalent. Uh, a FRA and a swap are essentially delta one products. So if rates go up, you win. If rates go down, you lose. Call options are not, they're asymmetric. If rates go up, you win. If rates go down, you walk away. And so it's not, we can't quite say a long call is equivalent to a long fra. But, but what we could do though is introduce another option such that the combined exposure ends up being a delta one product. So if we did a long call and at the same time 
sold a put option on interest rates, a short put, assuming that they have the, uh, the same strike and they are matching the expiries, then this will give us a Delta One product. Uh, there's a number of ways you can prove this. Probably the easiest one is to use put call parity. So remember the basis of put call parity, C minus P equals S minus the strike. Now, with put call parity, a positive value is where you're long, a negative is where you're short. So we are going to be long call plus C. We're going to do a short put minus P. Now, whichever way rates go, we're going to pay the strike. Because if rates go up, we exercise our call option. So we have to hand over the strike. If rates go down, the long put, that the person we sold the put to, they will exercise their put option. So they will say, right, we're going to sell to you, which means, unfortunately, you'll have to buy. So whichever way rates go, you'll have to hand over the strike. And that's equivalent, remember, to buy. When you buy something, you hand over money. So we're going to take the, the strike across the other side to make it plus the strike. And that equals S. That equals plus S. In other words, that equals a long synthetic position. We're basically long the underline, and here the underline is interest rate. Now, okay, strictly it should be the present value of the strike, but I just want to illustrate the point that by buying a call and saying a put on the same strike, same expiries, you have a synthetic long exposure. And therefore, we can now say these two together are similar to a FRA, which is similar to a swap. Now, of course, a swap it tends to be a series of cash flows. You know, it's unusual to take out a, a one-period swap. So it could be like a, a five-year swap settled every six months. And so therefore, to make it really uh, equivalent, you really want this long FRA, you really want many of them. You really want a, a series of them to make it equivalent. So you have one FRA, which has one uh, expiry date, then another one, then another one. And if you match the expiry dates with the swap dates, then it becomes equivalent. So therefore, to be the same, you should do the same with calls and puts. You don't want to simply buy one call and sell one put, because that would replicate one FRA. If you want to replicate a series of FRAs, then you want to buy a series of calls, and you want to sell a series of puts. Now, you should know what we call that. If you buy a series of calls, that's called a cap. If you sell a series of puts, that's called a floor. Together, it's a collar. So basically, you could repeat this and refer to this as a collar, or you could break it into more detail and say, you know what, we want to go long a cap and go short a floor. So it's a very common theme throughout the uh, curriculum about how to do an, an equivalent position. Okay, So make sure you're okay with these, these basics. So hopefully we're okay there about we could buy a series of forward rated contracts, a series of FRAs, or we could take out a series of options. So a series of calls and a series of puts. So buy a cap, sell a floor. The last one is probably the most important one, which we're going to build on to get to our pricing. And that's to view a swap as two bonds. So if you buy a bond, a regular normal bond, you'll receive a fixed coupon. Well, hang on, that's a bit like a swap, isn't it? If I want to receive fixed, I receive a fixed cash flow. If you buy a bond, you have to fund it. And you, know, you have to pay funding costs, which is like paying LIBOR. Well, OK, therefore, if LIBOR goes up, you lose. You're paying LIBOR on your funded position. Well, that's like a swap. If you're receiving fixed, you're paying LIBOR. So we can view a swap as like a bond. We have, uh, have the one leg is the fixed coupon side of the, of the bond. The other leg is really our funding side. Alternatively, you can view it as like a floating rate note, similar sort of thing. Yeah, but rather than think of it as funding, maybe think of it as selling a floating rate note. Either way, if LIBOR goes up, you have to pay more. So it's up to you. People think about it different ways, but you can certainly, hopefully, Think about a swap as like a bond position. And we're going to be using this as the basis of our pricing. So let's now move on and have a chat about pricing.